welcome on Watchers TV and welcome to a fresh edition of Primetime Watchmaking in the News. And these last few weeks have been rather busy with all the various shows here in Geneva and all the videos uh, we recently proposed to you, but we have a few additional things to share and we will also come back on the significance of what happened and its probable or let's say likable evolution. We will also talk about the strong auction action taking place in the coming days with of course a lot of Royal Oaks on the menu plus some other interesting stories and at the end we have a little surprise for you with the guy who did an internship at Watches TV more than 10 years ago and is now a stand-up comedian. I think you will have a good laugh but before this, news time! So yes, after two years of pause, uh, watchmaking celebration was back on the program and Geneva was at its epicenter with all the exhibitions taking place here. And boy, was it nice to go back to this type of ambiance, seeing at once all our friends from brands, our fellow journalist colleagues from almost everywhere around the world, as not everyone uh, managed to come due to ongoing travel restrictions, especially for those coming from Asia. But all in all, it was really a great moment and I believe it can only get better and I will develop on that. But before this, uh, let me summarize very simply the general mood among practically all the watch brands and let me put it this way. Everyone had huge smiles on their faces and yes, watchmaking as an industry is living a very happy moment or the backlogs are simply full. And if as a watch brand you're still doing bad, well, maybe it's time to change business and do something else. Well, nevertheless, we must always remember that the watchmaking industry has historically gone from one cycle to the other. So today's reality doesn't mean that everything will remain as is, but at least for a few more years, I don't see anything shaking this almost insolent uh, situation. And it's actually great for the entire ecosystem. I mean, brands and suppliers are going to be super busy. As now the big question concerns uh, production issues and with the shortages uh, witnessed almost everywhere, well, it will uh, most certainly still be complicated to get your hands on the watch of your desire, something accentuated with some uncontrollable speculation as timepieces have become such hot commodity for some. So quite crazy for sure, especially when you think of all the geopolitical uncertainties we're going through. But enough of that and let's uh, go back about uh, and talk about uh, two watches we got to see but, uh, but we haven't been able to produce dedicated video report on them. So for us one of the highlights of the show was the Chopard LUC Full Strike Sapphire. The first version of the Full Strike came out a few years back and I was already at the time so impressed by the acoustic performance of this minute repeater with its gong made out of sapphire. So at one point, I mean, they naturally had to go all the way and that's uh, what we've witnessed with this Full Sapphire version. Absolutely stunning and such a pleasure to listen to. I promise you it's totally unique. But Chopard also showed us another two uh, chiming uh, timepieces with the tourbillon version of the full strike coming in a rose gold case and also the simpler strike one which uh, chimes at the passage of each hour a mechanism you can set on or off. Okay, next one with Recense, the Belgian brand who presented the Type 8, a to-the-point version of their original take on watchmaking with an efficient hour and minute only display. So this has enabled them to simplify the movement mechanism and ultimately lower the price point coming now at 12,500 Swiss francs. So it's extremely light and super comfortable to wear. Personally really liked it and just for info we will soon publish a special report on the Type 2 as I had the chance of using it a few weeks as Benoit Maintiens let me borrow his personal watch. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Okay, so let's now go to the juicy part and talk about some behind the scenes stories regarding the evolution of the format of these watch shows. So as you realize through our coverage, uh, there were venues scattered all around the city. Reason uh, I personally thought referring to it as the Geneva Watch Week was more relevant. I mean, you had Watches and Wonders, a mix between what the SIH used to be and uh, some of the Basel World's uh, transfers. Then you had this Time to Watches exhibition located in an art school, Barton 7 with some other independent brands, the HCI in another place, 
other brands doing things at their own locations, such as Uwerk or MBNF, or in hotels such as uh, Jacob & Co and De Betune. Well, plenty of action everywhere. We're talking more than 100 brands. And though Geneva is small, and I enjoyed going from one place to the other, but there is for sure enough room at the main exhibition infrastructure where Watches & Wonder took place to house absolutely everyone under the same roof. And this is actually when it starts to become interesting. So the FHH, the Fondation La Haute Horlogerie, is the historical organizer of the SIHH and they benefited from an exclusivity contract with this location, a long-lasting contract coming to its end this year and this enables a total reshuffle and though the FHH uh, positioned themselves as being independent, it is clearly marked as a Richemont Group branch or subsidiary, if one can say so. Well, this year, with the arrival of mega players like Rolex and Patek Philippe, things have already gently evolved. And as a quick reminder, these two are from Geneva, so playing on home turf. At Basel World, you used to have an exhibitors committee, and this one had quite a say in the organization of the show. Well, this little tradition was reenacted for this edition of Watches and Wonder. Okay, there used to be one too before at the SHH, but with the, the new players around, well, there was a need for some other changes. And guess who directly took the driver's seat? Well, Rolex, of course, and its CEO, Jean Frédéric Dufour, became president of this committee. So far, minor changes, but I am pretty sure we are going to be in for some major ones and this for multiple reasons. So this year, when you entered the show, it was quite funny and symbolic at the same time as once this uh, greeting hall crossed, you either turn left and you were more or less in the XSIH configuration or you turn right and you were at Puzzle World. And in the middle, well, you had this uh, neutral zone with the carry disology. So physically, you could immediately sense different worlds trying to cohabit. On the Basel side, uh, brands had either taken and adapted their existing booth or they used this uh, SIH type infrastructure, same external layout for uh, everyone, and then you do what you want inside. But somehow, it felt a bit like uh, for brands such as Hublot, Targ, uh, Zenith, Grand Seiko, or it's as if they were put in the little corner. There was something slightly uninviting, just a personal feeling. Okay, I understand that uh, it was the first time, but for the LVMH brands who systematically did their own things downtown Geneva during all the previous SIHH by renting out an entire hotel, well, I'm uh, not sure this experience left them totally enthusiastic, especially since this come at a certain cost and probably higher than what they did uh, when they did their own thing. And this lets me rebound on another questionable aspect regarding the financial aspect of the event. First of all, you have this immense paradox. Watchmaking has never gone as strong as now and we didn't have any events in the last two years. So yes, uh, can leave you slightly puzzled, but you know my opinion on the matter and I really think that there is a purpose in such shows, uh, though things can and need to be uh, done differently. So one major difference between Baselworld and SIHH was that the first one was a public event. Came who wanted to come, you pay for your transportation, your hotel and your entrance tickets and you're in. Of course, some people were invited, but you get the idea. Whereas the SIH was a private event, distributors, retailers, and the international press got all invited full board. Nice business class tickets, five-star hotels, once inside, food and wine uh, nicely offered. Well, a full package and in all honesty, always spectacularly well organized, a true benchmark. But things have changed. Even the business model of the industry has evolved with uh, more brands and groups now taking directly care of their distribution and retailing, meaning that brands are basically selling to themselves and therefore do they need to pay the uh, high price tag for such an event? Well, probably not. And that's precisely the reason why brands such as Richard Mille and Audemars Piguet left the event a few years back. And I can promise you that it wasn't for just a question of money. I mean, I believe they can allow themselves to spend a few extra bucks uh, without being totally left naked. But it was more a question of logic and meaningfulness or lack of meaningfulness uh, to be more precise. So if the business dimension of such an event has evolved, what can be said about its purposefulness? Well, I'm still convinced uh, that it's totally relevant and it should uh, really be a moment of pure watchmaking celebration, a federating moment of the industry with its customers, retailers of course, but and customers too, and therefore be open to the public. Okay, maybe not the entire duration of the show, but at least a few days uh, should be available for the general public to attend. And I personally think that uh, with the likely changes in terms of who will have the final word regarding the organization of next year's edition, well, this is something which will be on the agenda, not even talking about local political authorities who will probably want the same. 
So furthermore, I also think that it will become more inclusive and we should see more brands under the same roof. And for instance, this year, three LVMH brands participated and the fourth one, Bulgari, was not allowed. Apparently a too big threat towards Cartier and Van Cleef and Arpels. It just shows how independent this FHH really is. And reason why Bulgari also did their own thing in a hotel at the same time. So I personally think this is slightly ridiculous and I sincerely hope we can now move on and indeed have everyone pulling in the same direction. I do understand that there is competition between brands, but ultimately one needs to see the big picture and the benefit for the entire watchmaking industry as a whole. Also the reason why I would love to see Swatch Group brands joining in too and have the likes of Richard Mille, AP and Grebel Fosse also come back. And I would also love to see smaller players being able to join the party. I mean, like I said, it's not the space that, it's the space that is lacking, but political will. And yes, you could have different zones for the big players with their own hospitality rules, for instance, and have other zones for other type of brands, meaning that the cost would not necessarily be the same for everyone. So you could also have, a, I don't know, auction houses present. Uh, well, there are plenty of possibilities to better serve the watchmaking community, whether professional visitors, media and general public, and it would be absolutely fantastic. Well, I guess you guys know my dreamy enthusiasm for such a venue, but even if it doesn't go all the way, there will be for sure a few changes regarding the main event of Watches and Wonder. And to give you a nice little side story about what happened this year, well, Mr. Bernard Arnault, chairman and owner of LVMH, came to visit the salon. I mean, three of his brands were participating, right? So after paying his little visit, he went on to visit the rest of the show and listen to this. He got profuse access to all the Richmond Group brands. Security had uh, been asked to place fences at the entrance of each brand's booth and told him that he could look at the side windows but could not get inside the booth. I mean, how immensely crazy is this? And as if he was going to commit industrial espionage himself. I mean, this is a real shock and I sincerely doubt he kept a beautiful souvenir out of this experience but just shows how unfortunately the short-sightedness of some people. And this is even more so regrettable, especially at a time when the FHH has to do its maximum to try to retain its influence in organizing the show as it is their main source of revenue. So by potentially losing this organization, well, it could well mean much more than that for the future of the FHH. Okay, enough politics, but let's stay with the FHH because beyond this organizational role, its mission also consists of promoting watchmaking culture. And one of the exhibition held during Watches and Wonder was later transferred to their city office and this time open to the public. So the theme was the notion of design and let's quickly listen to Aurélie Strait describing what was put on display. The, the role of the exhibition is to showcase the creativity of wristwatches across the ages. And uh, contrary to what have, because we've seen already this exhibition at the Watches and Wonder, but now this one is open to the public. What was kind of the reason for this? Yes, we, we revealed this exhibition at Watches and Wonder Geneva 22, and we are very happy to have it here right now at Le Pont de la Machine in Geneva until 8th of May. All right, thank you very much. Okay, before talking about the upcoming series auctions taking place here, just wanted to share something different with you. I'm a golfer, not necessarily a very good one, but just love the game. My mental exercise session, just keep calm and focused. Well, at least try. Anyhow, a few weeks back, I went with some good golf buddies of mine for a few days down to Portugal and Hublot kindly lent me their Big Bang Unico golf watch. It was an interesting experience to play around with as it features this mechanical scorekeeping mechanism, which is extremely easy to use. I mean, you just press the yellow pusher to add a stroke. Then once you finish you, your hole, press the white pusher to change hole and uh, the counter will reset to zero. But in the middle, all your shots will con be continuously added till you finish uh, your round. Only limit, you can't score above 100, which unfortunately can happen. So the watch is pretty light, uh, so not an issue to play with, but with my rather small wrist, I have to say that the crown was scratching the top of my hand and despite the fact that it is protected with some rubber coating, well, I prefer to take it off after a little while. Okay, after this short, playful interlude, let's now talk about these auctions uh, because we have an intense program ahead of us. We recently published a video on the Blue Themes uh, selection by Nation, and that was pretty sweet to have this uh, all here. But for the coming uh, days, the big star will of course be the Royal Oak as a tribute to its 50th anniversary. Philips, uh, Bax & Russo will have a dedicated auction with no less than 88 models, including a very special one, the lot number 8. 
as this is simply the serial number two of any royal oak ever. Number quite something. So this special sale will occur on Friday the 6th, followed by more classical sale, a sale on the 7th and 8th with 300 lots uh, spread on those two days. And Sotheby's uh, will also have 60 Royal Oaks on sales, including probably the highlight of the auction with lot 72, a good number, a very good year. Uh, with the personal watch of Gérald Janta, a bimetallic version. And this auction will occur on the 10th, followed on the 11th with some other interesting lots. And Christie's uh, focuses on the Kairos collection, consisting of 128 modern Patek Philippe watches. And the sale of uh, this collection will be spread into three parts. The first one taking place in Geneva on the 9th of May, followed by Hong Kong on the 24th. And finally, the largest part of the collection, approximately half of it, will be sold in New York on the 8th and 9th of June. And for info, the name Kairos stands for an ancient Greek word meaning the right critical or opportune moment. And I guess the actual owner of the collection will have his final judgment on this saying after the three sales behind. Okay, we're almost done, but just wanted to share uh, just a couple of things uh, with you guys. So the first one concerns one of the craziest uh, timepiece recently seen with the Doppelganger. It's an Austrian brand which participated in this uh, Time to Watches event. I mean, really don't understand this name, uh, though I, I thought I would get used to it, but no. Anyhow, this Doppelganger's main feature is to show the time with two sliding bars, and I can promise you that it's big. It's seriously big and thick, and for info, it's Andrea Streller who contributed in the development of this quite unique and complex timepiece. And before saying goodbye, I would like to thank you all for the kind words received regarding our coverage of this uh, Geneva Watch Week. Has been intense, uh, but a true pleasure. And to close that chapter, I just wanted to say a little bravo to Patek Philippe, uh, because uh, if Watches and Wonders was uh, close to the public, they nevertheless presented at the very same time in their flagship boutique of the Rue du Rhône all the novelties that were shown to us. I think this was very smart and I did meet a few guys who came specifically to Geneva to enjoy this uh, watchmaking celebration without being able to go to Watches and Wonder. And for them, well, this was uh, still a nice treat. Again, hats off and uh, smart of Patek to have done so. Okay, and as a little teaser for the coming weeks, we have some nice reports coming your way behind the scene of the restoration of an amazing antique Ferdinand Berthoud marine chronometer. I always love when we can do these types of long follow-ups on such projects. Then we will have another nice follow-up with our good friend Philippe Dufour and his daughter Daniela. Check out how things are evolving for her and plenty of other good things, including a long interview with Madame Jacqueline Dimier, a very important watch designer who contributed immensely on the success of the Royal Oak. In a certain way, Gérald Janta set the blueprint of this iconic watch, and she basically took it from there and made it into this huge success for AP. But now I have a fun story to share with you regarding what will be seen after our Viva watchmaking uh, celebration. Uh, at the very beginning of Watches TV, 11 years ago, an intern worked for us for a few months and his name is Charles Nouveau. He had done some very serious university studies which should have led him to, uh, into a nice corporate career, but he chose a totally different path and after his, uh, this internship, he decided to become a stand-up comedian. Quite a radical change, I like this. So during Watches and Wonder, Ulysse Nardin had the original and inspired idea of letting him use the time they had available for the brand's presentation to do a little show regarding watchmaking. Sincerely, I can only salute Elise Nardin to have done so, totally proved that they dare to do things uh, differently, and I think you will spend a good time listening to some extract of this uh, performance. So a huge Viva Watchmaking to you, thanks so much uh, uh, to our good patrons, thanks for watching and see you real soon, and yes, I know this was a pretty long edition of Prime Time, but some things just had to be said. Enjoy our good friend Charles Nouveau, off we go. Uh, and if you're thinking, man, I wish Chris Nardin had brought a famous uh, movie star instead of this guy, uh, don't worry, so they. I was told they were hesitating between launching a $250 collab with Swatch or bringing in a stand-up comedian. And don't we all make mistakes? <laughs> to be honest, I'm not even the first choice they had uh, as a comedian. Uh, they were quite open about that when they met with me. <laughs> Uh, I didn't have the heart to tell them that they were not my first choice either as a, <laughs> as a watch brand when I met them and I thought I was lost because the front door said Jihad <laughs> uh, So apparently they're not even the first choice of their landlord. <laughs> 
I'd, I'd personally like to congratulate Van Rijn, uh, who said that by 2025, 30% of their collection will be made with recycled parts, uh, recycled materials. I think that's, that's very cool. I heard that during their presentation, and uh, because I listened to other presentations as well, I can safely say that this year, in 2022, 70% of all the presentations in this salon were made with recycled materials as well. <laughs> and Jesus Christ, everyone is talking about the same things, it's crazy! Every brand in this salon claims they're innovative, technologically advanced, precise, sustainable, iconic, and most importantly, unique. Just like everyone else. Congratulations. Yeah, I know, I know that first times are scary, obviously, I know. I, uh, it kind of feels like I'm losing my virginity all over again right now, <laughs> up here in front of you guys. But uh, this time it's cool because it's Ulysse Nardin who paid. <laughs> <laughs> because because uh, the people who show up at these things are paid. I hope you're aware of that. I know that all the ambassadors up here are going to say things like, it's such an honor to work with, na 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 na. Uh, but no one really says why they're here. They're here because they're paid. Uh, my favorite watch brand is the same as their favorite watch brand, aka the one who is currently employing me. Uh, I say currently because like many ambassadors, I am absolutely open for more lucrative <laughs> options. Uh, I know that Brad Pitt, who happens to be my all-time favorite actor, by the way, uh, very underrated in my opinion, and I saw him online on pictures wearing a, a Patek Philippe. So um, I don't know if that was as an ambassador or just as a handsome client, um, but clearly that guy has more watches than he has kids, and uh, that's saying something. Really. Um, I'm sure most of the watches were free though, uh, unlike the kids. <laughs> Tiger Hero used to have uh, Leonardo DiCaprio as an ambassador. Um, that lasted for three years, uh, which I believe makes it officially his longest relationship to date. Uh, the brand was born in 1860, and we all know that that's way too old for Leo. And Rolex, who uh, was a uh, Gargantuous uh, stand over there uh, has Roger. Who doesn't love Roger? He, I mean, apart from Novak Djokovic, who doesn't love Roger <laughs> on uh, on Earth? That's a great ambassador, really great ambassador. I changed personally. I changed past the brands because of an advert with Roger Federer, personally. Uh, and I have to say, it's a waste, I think, to make an advert about pasta with a tennis player and not use the rackets to strain. The pasta, it's a shame. I think we love Roger almost to an exaggerated point. I think it's, we, we love him so much. I think that, to a scary level, I think if you ask Swiss people to choose between, I don't know, the survival of five endangered species and five more good years for Roger Federer's knees, I would like to pre-book my seats for the Davis Cup and personally apologize to the pandas and their families. Really, uh, we love Roger Federer. He could get away with anything. He could get away with murder. I, you know his face is going to end up on our money at some point. It's going to happen. So Rolex are going to have the first ambassador whose face is actually on currency. It's crazy. <laughs> and as if money and luxury watches needed to get closer together. But um, imagine as an ambassador, you know, like, hello, my name is George Washington. I used to own slaves, but now I own a Daytona. No, that would, uh, that wouldn't work. I, for instance, was born here. I uh, am the grandson of uh, an immigrant, the grandson of a refugee, even, uh, since my grandfather uh, came here a long time ago to escape from the oppression of uh, French taxes. Some of my university exams were actually here, in this building, which serves a lot of different purposes, which is why if you go to the bathrooms and you look under the toilet seats, there are actually political science answers under them. And uh, you'll also find uh, on the toilet seats traces of cocaine, but that has nothing to do with university, that's just because we're in Geneva. Um, oh yeah, there's way more drugs here than in Basel. I don't know if that's why certain brands decided to them. I remember the only time I came to this salon 10 years ago, uh, Hishamin had just uh, come up with uh, you know, that uh, very iconic transparent watch that everyone was talking about. Um, I'll, so uh, I'll invite you to look at my wrist to a new prototype, Willis Nardin has uh, just uncovered. This is a prototype, I'm not going to answer questions about uh, this watch, I hope you, you understand. Well, they might have pretty badass ambassadors. They have Leo Messi, they have Novak Djokovic, who I mentioned before, they have LeBron James. And I get the idea behind that, right? It's that uh, 
you know, they're huge champions. So if you get the watch, you get to feel like a champion. Even if you're out of shape, even if you're bald, even if you work in mergers and acquisitions, you can have the spirit of a winner in exchange for losing $80,000. I, uh, I like that brands are getting athletes as ambassadors because obviously, you know, luxury watches, they're a bit elitist and, you know, sports are very democratized, but sports are for everyone. So it's great that brands are also trying to appeal to the everyday person that likes the simple pleasures in life like golf, sailing, or polo. I know Lewis Hamilton was here the other day for IWC. Um, I don't know if you guys watched that docu-series on Netflix, the Drive to Survive Formula One thing. Uh, I thought comedians had ego problems. Holy shit. Uh, those guys need therapists like it's oxygen, seriously. Uh, for real, but um, I, th I think Formula One drivers are amazing because to get there, to get to Formula One, you need to be the very best at what you do or be pretty good at what you do and have your daddy buy the team. <laughs> and I think it's kind of the same for watch brand CEOs in a way. And I promise that's the last joke I'll do about Tagovia. <laughs> <laughs> An important element can be the slogan. Patek Philippe has, I believe, maybe the most famous one of all. Very classy, you know, you all know it. You never really own a Patek Philippe merely hold on to it for the next generation. I personally always thought that kind of sounded like an advertising, an advertisement for a sexually transmitted disease, you know? Uh, you never really own chlamydia. You merely hold on to it until the next generation. Uh, that's what happens when you do too much touch and feel, I think. Uh, uh, just one. one last big brand image component I'd say is location, obviously. Where do brands show themselves? Uh, I personally live in Paris half the time, and one day when I was walking home, I came across Place Vendôme. You, you all know Place Vendôme, that beautiful place in Paris. And um, first of all, I, I told myself, oh my god, I live next to Place Vendôme, that's pretty cool. I don't live next to Place Vendôme, I was lost. Uh, yeah, but then I have the world's greatest score as ambassador, we just now have the worst, clearly. Uh, but I, I, I remember I got in front of the Cartier shop, Cartier has a shop on Place Vendôme, and the one thing that I noticed was the timetable on it. It said that the store opened at 11 a.m. And I said, what, what, what kind of store opens at 11 a.m.? And then I realized that if you have the means to shop at Cartier, you probably have the means to decide that mornings no longer apply to you. <laughs> so that must be it. We're all here discussing luxury watches, we're all here uh, presenting luxury watches, but only a small portion of the people here can actually afford the, the watches. I think that ironically the, the people who can most afford the watches in the salon are the ambassadors and they're the ones getting them for free. So that's uh, <laughs> a bit ridiculous. I, um, I'm definitely not getting a watch. I'm, I'm not getting a watch, right? For I'm not getting a watch uh, for free. And the people at least now not told me that there's a phenomenon right now where there's a concentration where buyers tend to concentrate on a few a uh, bunch of brands and forget about others. And they, did, they didn't tell me which brands exactly, but I could tell from the tone they were using that theirs was not one of them. <laughs> Talk about that. One of the watches is called The Freak, uh, which makes my presence here way more logical when you think about it, <laughs> uh, way more coherent. They, uh, they set up a beautiful campaign called Vertical Odyssey, where the image is a shark that flies. And I don't know how people are supposed to trust your technological expertise if you think that sharks can fly, but uh, Breitling have planes, Parmigiani have balloons, and we have flying sharks. Uh, I told you there were more drugs here than in Basel. Uh, but I think my time is up, and uh, I say I think my time is up because my phone is dead and I've never wore a watch in my life. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon.